Oh, I'm sorry. I just I just turned on the recording. Terribly sorry. Um, it's shaped by institutional cultures in university materials, and as we saw in Dr. Khan and Dr. Jennings' paper. And then in terms of communicating essentials to the general public, as was pointed out as, as one of the most crucial roles for language scholars by Dr. Cashin. These and other speakers are quite correct to point to the prevalence of English. And yet they also point out its limited utility in certain contexts. So this is the moment that we live in and share in history when languages are an issue in trying to um, take on our medical and healthcare understanding. Here at Hedra, we have a translation project that we are working on related to values in healthcare communication. Now, I want to borrow your screens just for one moment and just show you the International Charter for Human Values in Healthcare. One moment, please. So here it is in the journal Patient Education and Counseling. You all represent at least a dozen languages. Um, and each translation of the International Charter um, means a publication. And so this is what I have just emailed you about. We would like to translate the Charter and to do a little bit of research on the fact that the values entailed in the Charter are, of course, different culture to culture culture. All right, so if you're interested, please do email me and I will be very pleased to get started on that with you. Ah, Dr. Tiaco is just joining us. Um, now I would like to ask Dr. Esther Book Longman, um, who is one of the authors and also the representatives of the Charter, um, to say a few words of welcome. Dr. Longman. Dr. DeCourcy, thank you so much. And, and uh, thank you for your kind words. I want to say hello, welcome to all of our participants. Um, I, um, I, I know that on this inaugural uh, process, uh, we were all hoping that we would have not only a good turnout, but exciting presentations. And, and I believe that we all who have been in the process of organizing this uh, have realized that all of our expectations and hopes have been exceeded. You have been wonderful participants. We have had excellent presentations. And I think that the, 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 the early beginnings of networking and working together on future projects is already starting to be seen. And that is the goal that Hedra has had for this process. So this small committed group of, of, of linguists and, and communicating uh, communication experts and, and uh, people in healthcare looking at how we can start to connect to to areas that are not necessarily heard or seen uh, by some of the um, uh, traditional um, means of, of, of uh, publication and communication. And this is the first start. Uh, we hope it will continue with the same degree of enthusiasm, and we're very excited about it. With regard to the International Charter for uh, Human Values in Healthcare, uh, this is work that, that we started out in 2011 and published no, in 2014. And it, and it addresses really the need for the need for respect, for visibility, for compassion, for professionalism, for for justice in in healthcare and in all of the communications that occur in the healthcare system, whether or not we're talking about the care provider and the patient or within the healthcare team. And if we take it more broadly and say this is how hopefully we live our lives, many of us have seen this challenged in the, the, the past year with with the pandemic and not only in our working environments, but in, in every environment. I'm hoping that you all have, that you and your loved ones have, have survived and thrived uh, in this most difficult of times. And we're looking forward to continuing this, this discussion and work with you if you choose to, to continue the, the collaboration and networking that we're referring to. Uh, Dr. DeCourcy talked about the desire to have the charter translated into additional languages. Um, and we would love to have you be part of that if you would like. Um, we talk about these as universal values, but of course, as she said, they are, they are generally accepted universally, but there may be different weightings on them uh, in, by culture and by, by certain, you know, certain groups or, or, or people who, who experience you know, healthcare in different ways in different settings. So we would love to hear from you and please uh, uh, email Dr. DeCourcy uh, if you are interested. I'm going to stop there and, and turn back to now to Dr. DeCourcy who will introduce Dr. Allison. Please go ahead. All right. Um, 
Well, it, how can I possibly introduce uh, Dr. Matheson? Um, Professor Matheson, <laughs> um, uh, Christian, um, I'm going to hand the floor to you and ask you to make uh, your remarks. Um, I believe you all understand um, that we want to get to the round table. Christian, you're muted. Sorry, this is the, the pre-talky version of my, my little, <laughs> it's a silent version. <laughs> no, I'd just like to say, I'd like to echo my, my colleagues and friends in, in uh, welcoming you and in thanking you for the uh, wonderful uh, contributions you've already made. Uh, and uh, I think that we've already achieved one of the goals to have a wonderful uh, range, a spectrum of uh, talks and to begin to get to know each other. Uh, as Christina has already said and, and Brooke, uh, we are already beginning to build the network and ideas for research. I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, one of the advantages maybe of a virtual conference like this uh, is we can skip what we would no doubt have had in various places, a very, very long introductory ceremony and long introductions of the individual speakers that take up about 75% of the, of the speaking time. So uh, that's great. And I hope uh, we continue to evolve the subculture of virtual conferences uh, but uh, one day we will also meet in person in different contexts. So that's fantastic. Uh, and there will be this wonderful sense of uh, recognition. Uh, I note that the idea of illuminating language and the pandemic from different angles has worked beautifully. Uh, so we've had it from a discourse, a language, a metaphor, educational, etc. perspective. Uh, focus on English, fo focus on issue of multilinguality, uh, and that's just wonderful. I also note that we've been very lucky in the sense of having a virtual conference bringing people together from places where we could probably not have been able to meet face to face, right? Uh, that's always been a challenge in the past. I think we're overcoming this now. Uh, one of the outcomes of the, this conference and the next conference, but also other conferences that Hedra is organizing and, and hosting, is start new research projects. And the idea here is really to, as it were, achieve what is not achievable individually. So the notion that together uh, we can achieve research that what we individually couldn't do, but also publications. So it should have that kind of effect of a whole that's greater than the parts. Now we've noticed already, of course, uh, when you submitted the, your, your uh, uh, abstracts, but then also through the, uh, the presentations, the recorded presentations, that one of the strong motifs coming through uh, has to do with metaphors. So language and the pandemic especially metaphorical framings of different aspects of the pandemic. Uh, and we think that uh, viewing what you've contributed, uh, this could be the starting point, the seeding of a, a very exciting new research project. Uh, and we'd like to invite you to join us at this. And the example, the, 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 the in initial ex example you'd have to provide us simply uh, metaphors of COVID at any point in the reporting, in any kinds of text, uh, whether it's official uh, weekly reports from the WHO or other health authorities, governments, uh, news reports, tweets, uh, conversation among friends, uh, all this would be a very good way of getting a sense of a kind of multifaceted engagement with uh, COVID-19. And by engagement, I mean both understanding of it, sort of modeling of it, uh, but also something that a number of you pointed out, the 
interpersonal interaction with it. I mean, how we value it and how we conceive of it in such a way that we can move forward with uh, positive measures. Uh, so that's one project we would like to suggest. And I think by now you've received an email message with a short description uh, outline of this project, right, Christina? Yes, it's just gone out. Yeah, uh, and that email message will also contain uh, a special uh, email address uh, where you can send uh, expressions of interest. And of course, it would be fantastic to have um, as many of you as are interested involved. And importantly, also an opportunity to look at this in terms of different languages. Uh, now, the purpose of this project then would be to collect, to create a unique corpus, and then to analyze it and to have material for next year's installment of Language and the Pandemic Conference. Uh, but of course, also publications, publications that would not otherwise be available. So we will have a collective resource uh, to draw on uh, and we can discuss different combinations of publication uh, teams. Uh, now these, these examples could be URLs. You have found something where you, there are texts available, uh, photos, images, uh, monomodal, multimodal, monolingual, multilingual. Uh, all of this, I think, would be very, very valuable. Uh, of course, probably the first kind of, of metaphor that comes to mind would be lexical metaphor, or what our friends in cognitive linguistics uh, since Lakoff and Johnson 1980 have called conceptual metaphor. But conceptual metaphor is essentially lexical metaphors. Uh, but a grammatical metaphor is also very important. Uh, and as I tried to hint in my talk, uh, they have a very pervasive effect of, as it were, depopulation, depopulating discourses. So meaning the discourse are no longer about people taking part in processes, but they are about, as it were, thingified processes uh, that are break out, occur, uh, spread, and so on but the actual people impacted by COVID-19 are sort of held in the background. And that's typical of the effect of grammatical metaphor. Uh, but I hope, I have to think about this uh, and uh, we look forward to taking this further. I should say that uh, for this, but also for the conference in general, we're already talking to, we're already identifying and talking to possible publication channels beyond the, the um, uh, what you've already seen in the booklet and and uh, uh, anything that we do together. But as I said before, one aspect of this project is precisely to publish together. Thank you. Any aspects you would like to add, Christine Ambrook? No, the, the, comfort, the project announcement has gone out and I really yep. welcome you to, uh, to write to us and to send us material. Hey. Brooke. I, I was just going to ask Christian among the among the different considerations, um, not only about people's perceptions and experiences with with COVID, but I'm wondering if people would would be willing to, since you talked about uh, the metaphors and the experiences of, of official publications and announcements about it around the world and how people have perceived COVID to be based on what their what their official you know description of it is. I mean, in in, our, in, in the United States, we had a leader who said it wasn't anything to be worried about and don't wear masks and things like this. And that profoundly affected the way people considered it and, and approached it. And I think also, to, sadly, significantly affected, you know, uh, people's uh, experience with it in a negative way. They didn't protect themselves as they had it. And we had many lives and in many cases uh, that, that suffered because of this. So I just wonder if, if, if people would be able to, as part of what you're talking about, Christian, kind of talk about the discord, perhaps, or the gap that exists between what, 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 what was being announced and what continues to be announced versus compared to their experiences. I think that would be an interesting part of that corpus. Would be fantastic. And, and I, I mean, I remember uh, the President Trump early on, it was the simile as it were, I mean, I should say kind of metaphor was, it's just like a seasonal flu. Exactly. And it'll be gone by, it'll be gone by early, early, early spring. Uh, so I didn't I mean to interrupt, that, but I just I yeah. wanted to ask that because we have a wonderful representation across 
many continents here, and it would be very exciting to see people's perspectives if they're comfortable sharing that. Yes, and I think unfortunately that that uh, also had an impact in other parts of the world. Tragically, in Brazil, of course, with with uh, uh, Bolsonaro, who is of the same ilk, uh, and then suddenly Trump switched, and he was a wartime president. Uh, so <laughs> this absolutely is is. Uh, is absolutely relevant, I think, yeah. Well, I recognize that the politics of this could be could be awkward for some people depending on where they are and, and given the circumstances um, of, of their ability to speak out, but whatever they're comfortable sharing or to say this is what we perceive it to be from, from our authorities and this is what our real life was, would also give us boots on the ground equivalent experience that hasn't really been talked about with the exception of some places like like Doctors Without Borders and some other, other places have tried to get this in the news, United Nations, um, you know, UNESCO and so on. But I think that this would be an avenue for our, for their voices to be heard and for us to take take advantage of this sad opportunity of, of the pandemic uh, to, to move, move that into uh, more of a spotlight than is received. All right, so let's throw the floor open and get some responses to book. I left them speechless or wanting, I'm not sure which. <laughs> well, maybe we, <laughs> uh, okay. Hey, professor, great, this, is Renuka. this is Renuka. And uh, we are really happy about the project that is uh, going to be launched. We would very much be interested in participating in that. And uh, we would uh, certainly know more about uh, the work. Indeed, I'm yet to go through the pamphlet that's uh, sent through the mail, sir. We'll go through it and we'll certainly work for that. Yes. Great. That's, that's wonderful. Uh, and, uh, and as far as the publication part is concerned, we are really interested in uh, doing good publications along with the team. Yes. Wonderful, yeah. Uh, and this... This may relate to a question, one of the questions been asked, and we may have an opportunity to come back to, uh, somebody was interested in the comparison of the situation in India and in Ghana. I think partly because we've had such great contributions from both countries. Yes. Uh, and that would be fascinating in terms of scale, in terms of the uh, different multilingual uh, aspects and so on. So uh, many things. Um, in, in fact, Dr. Padova, I would like to ask you about that. So um, I had sent you the question that um, what makes India and Ghana different when a leader makes speeches? How do we account for the differences in the impact? Um, would you be able to speak to that for us? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the doubt on interlanguage uh, error, isn't it, ma'am? I think there was a question on interlanguage error. Uh, yes. Yes. And um, uh, our Indian students, they uh, generally have this problem. Um, when they learn um, the L2 language, that's English, they relate it to the L1, their mother tongue. And uh, the language that they learn, the L2 language, gets filtered and it gets modified. And because of that, they make uh, certain errors. And we are trying to, as teachers, we are trying to, um, I mean, uh, avoid uh, I mean, prevent students from making uh, those mistakes. So that certainly happens. In our paper, elaborately, we have mentioned the kind of errors they make. Say, for example, um, they overgeneralize things also. When they learn a language, in one of the examples that I've quoted, we have quoted, we have mentioned, I does not know. Um, since they uh, learned that I is, um, uh, I mean, uh, along with singular uh, subject, singular noun, they can use yes form of the verb. They use it for I also, thinking I is singular. So such mistakes are um, still committed by students. Though they learn uh, language from their uh, first standard, some of the students learn uh, English from their play school uh, level, uh, but then they keep making these mistakes, ma'am. But then after coming to college, uh, when they become mature enough to learn things with good understanding, they are uh, trying to avoid these mistakes. And uh, surprisingly, when they get into companies, 
um, we are working in an engineering college and during on campus interviews and after getting into the companies they start speaking uh, good english maybe because of the good exposure they get we uh, train the students in communication skills and when they get into the company because of the exposure and because of uh, the work culture there they have to speak in english in the company among the colleagues so they pick up english very easily that's really good okay. so when our students yes uh, they learn english for nearly 14 years in school and they get trained in english in the college also for 2 to 3 years and after getting into company within 3 uh, to 4 months because of the exposure they pick up good language oh, that's right. really uh, nice yes. yes thank you very much all right i so invite we... dr kanchanamala also to uh, throw some light on this well dr kanchanamala uh, we will return to that in a moment um what i'd like to do now is pick up on what dr longmaid was mentioning um So um Enoch uh, Dr. Tiko could you could we get back to Dr. Uh, Longmaid's question about um the whole the whole issue of Ghana and India so I'd, I'd actually really like to ask both Dr. Pedova and Dr. Tiko to speak to that if they would Go ahead please Dr. Uh, Dr. Tiko Enoch I'd like good to see you there <laughs> Have you got access to to the microphone Okay uh many thanks for the invitation but just a clarification hello christian good to see you good to see good you to also see you uh, yeah, great to see you. i feel so lucky to be among uh, lots of friends thank you yes uh, yeah okay christian go on you can go on uh no 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 are you uh, very uh good to see you and and uh, if you have any thoughts about uh the the comparison of india and ghana from the ghanian perspective uh right okay all right uh thank you uh i was stuck by talking about the, the presentation on inter language error analysis uh, personally listening to the the presentation uh, my a mind went back to call this distinction between errors and mistakes and uh i realized that in most cases the students were able to identify some of the uh, uh deviations let me use that word for the sake of uh being neutral and not using either errors or, or mistakes but uh, in most cases when they identify that this is a mistake and they they correct them call that previous year advance an argument that we may have to call that as a, a mistake and not necessarily errors and in Ghana what has been the debate on this aspect of our interlanguage is uh, uh whether or not this leads us to actually claim that the mistakes of students which eventually evolve as part of them as adults of a uh, tertiary education is descriptive of their own variety of english so uh, still there are people who have reservations so much when it comes to instances where students are unable to identify the deviations in so to speak they they have errors and then we are now wanting to classify these errors as definitive of their their variety of english but the situation here uh, to move on to talk about the case in ghana is much the same as we have in india uh we go through almost all our, our educational uh levels uh learning english first uh, as uh, a language for instructional purposes and, and later for some of us who end up in linguistics studying it as a field of study most of us from basic school to the university uh took english as a subject uh, up to the university and most of pedagogical work here in Ghana is done through the form of, of english but again moving a bit to the case of metaphor i think is is really interesting uh to consider metaphor in comparison of of, of metaphors but what strikes me in the presentations uh with the fact that um ah we we lost him at the at just at the most uh, dramatic uh, moment Ghana, personally this ah, 
Uh, am I back? Uh, Go ahead, please. I, I hope you do hear me now. Yes. Okay. So uh, from from uh, I used to travel a lot during the, the intense part of the COVID for some assignments. More often when you, you encountered folk uh, people talking about COVID-19, they were they were hardly uh, shocked by COVID-19. In most of them, they considered that to be a conspiracy that the president and many other people were nearly deceiving them. So on the one hand, we, we found political leaders construing uh, some war metaphor of COVID-19. And then we, we find on the other hand, uh, ordinary citizens considering that to be a conspiracy to keep them in their homes and, <laughs> and engage in some kind of uh, underhand dealings here and there. So I, I would be happy in future for us to explore this dynamic, but uh, so that we don't focus so much on the perspective of the leaders, but also from the perspective of, uh, so to speak, uh, the lay people, right? I think I'll end here. Many thanks for, for the chance. Fantastic. That's great, yes. And if I can add something to what uh, Enoch said. Um, Madison, hi. Eva hi, hi, good to see you. <laughs> yes. Very good to see you. Yes, so um, the, the, uh, uh, some papers have also looked at um, the pandemic from the discourse uh, perspective. And we, our paper in particular, um, our presentation looks at it from the discourse pers perspective. Mm -hmm. And the focus has been on the persuasion. I think Ghana, if we are going to compare Ghana with India, then we'll look at how persuasive the language has been. And that yeah. the president of Ghana used a lot of persuasive language that actually appealed to the conscience of the people. And um, now he did this at a point uh, uh, when the, the, the whole idea of the virus was still a mystery, and if I can call it that. And so the, the, you know, just to tie in the metaphor bit, it worked very well because the word metaphors were used and that created some amount of fear too, you mm -hmm. know. Um, some amount of fear among a certain group, as um, Enoch put it. But I will put this group, uh, you know, looking at it from a social linguistic perspective, I would, have put, I would put this group at, um, you know, ages 40 and above who probably have seen Ghana uh, at, in times when Ghana once experienced some instability in the country. But for the youth, um, it was more of a comic when you, when you uh, check social media, uh, Facebook, um, Twitter. It was more of comedy for them. And uh, WhatsApp people sent comic videos about it. So with the youth, it was more of, you know, they were not too scared about it and some dared to move on. But the president generally used a lot of persuasive language and that worked for, for him and uh, for the country, it worked until a point when um, people also felt um, it was an issue of power and dominance. Uh, you know, looking at it again from the discourse per perspective, there was the issue of power and dominance. And so people felt their freedoms had been taken away from them. And, and so people veered out and that's not what probably would be different from um, Ghana, uh, you know, Ghana comparing Ghana with India. But population wise to comparatively, we we'll say Ghana is comparatively a very small country as compared to India. And so managing Ghana probably has also been um, not too difficult for the president. Then there has been the enforcement of the law. So apart from the language, the language uh, has worked well being persuasive but the education has also gone on very well using language that is accessible to all levels of the population. And again, the use of different native languages, the indigenous languages, education went on very well in the indigenous languages. And that has also worked very well for the Ghanaian community. Um, 
I don't know how that applies to India, but this is, uh, in our context, this is how it has uh, panned out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Kanchana Mara, would you like to speak to this topic? How is it that it is effective or less effective when leaders speak? Hello, everybody. I'm glad to meet you all today in this forum. Um, Dr. M. Renuka and I have presented a paper. Hope you would have seen the videos. Uh, I would like to add some points. Um, I saw the question that we have got. I would just like to clarify the same. Um, L2 learners, they make several mistakes while writing. Uh, the reasons are many. Mm, they have their mother tongue influence. Sometimes they find the target language difficult to understand. Um, they run short of words. They do not know the correct vocabulary to use and they make certain mistakes when they write. As Renuka ma'am said, uh, they are improving. They are definitely improving when they go for a job and especially when they study in the final year, we can see a lot of improvements in their writing. Our learners are never less inferior to anybody. And in fact, their prior knowledge and experiences can be considered as a treasure to improve their English learning. That is what we have faced. It's our experience. They are really improving. Thank you. Very encouraging, yeah. Thank you, sir. All right, well, um, I'm pleased to say that I've had a number of, oh, um, Gada, hi. No, you're not on the, oh, there we are. Go ahead, please, Dr. al -Salani. Hi, everyone. Hi there. Uh, hope you are all doing great. I just wanted to express my gratitude to be with you all here today. And I just want to say that this is my first time in conference. And I'm um, really, really hope that my paper uh, being liked by all of you and uh, have the opportunity to see my paper on YouTube. And uh, I just want to say that I'm really happy to be part of this wonderful experience and have the opportunity to be with you all here. And thank you so much. Uh, we're really happy to have you. It's great that thank you're here. You so Thank you very much. Absolutely, thank you. So, so perhaps I can move on to the next topic. I received a number of questions by email. So I sent you out that, that sort of email about it and I got a, a five or six questions from you. So one of the questions that I have involves this whole question of multilingualism. So I had a question about whether or not this was a cultural thing or was it as Dr. Pradowski seems to think the, the, a, a personal thing. Now, I sent the question to Dr. Karlowski. His response was that there, this was a question about particularly the cultural flexibility to tolerate ambiguity, which is part of the big five personality trait thing. And his, his response was, and I'm reading this, this was not, this was found as, um, oh, the question was, this was found as not correlating in a Chinese study and then he replies, if we don't report it in the slides, and the, then the correlation was less than 0.2, and it was not significant. But I think there's an interesting question there because a number of people brought up questions about cultural differences. Um, so I'd just like to read you another one. Um, the paper by Yan Wei Wang draws the conclusion that the contrast of adverbial connectors are suggestive of a cultural difference between Chinese and English discourse, but later in her, her conclusion, she seems to back away from that, saying that contrast works in all the functional categories. So is there a cultural difference or not? And so sort of implicit in a lot of what we've been looking at are, is the question of that contrast between a language that is local and English language materials in representing COVID. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out for some, for some discussion. What's the difference? when we're looking at materials 
that, that represent COVID. There is something I heard, and it's it's it will be irrelevant in in different places around the world. Uh, but just coming back for a moment to India and and Ghana, uh, it's. I mean, one way of thinking about it is the combination of the different languages and the registers or genres of functional varieties, uh, because I think as both you you Emma and and you know you said. And Renuga, you, you, you pointed out, as you move through the educational system, or, or rather, as you grow up uh, in the family and neighborhood, and then you move through the educational system, you would, of course, expand your registerial range. And we could say that's one thing we all do through life. We keep, we keep uh, 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 you know, adding registers to our, our range of registers we can operate in, taking on new roles and so on. Uh, but in these early years, family and neighborhood and then formal education, that may also involve a switch of languages. Uh, and I think that's very interesting to document. And I think you also mentioned that uh, different people have, as it were, diff access to different kinds of discourses, uh, depending on where they are in society. So I, I see this as part and parcel of, of the same complex picture, fascinating and important. Sir, I would like to add one more thing. Culture also has an impact in the attitude of uh, speaking in English. Uh, in many cultures, it's not appreciated to speak in English. So people uh, shy away from speaking in English, and that is how they don't pick up language at an early age. So later on, after realizing the importance, they start picking up the language due to the college environment and uh, workplace environment. So culture has uh, this kind of impact also on the aptitude and attitude of language learning. That's true, sir. Yes, uh, not 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 to, to 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 grab the floor too much, but uh, coming from growing up in a country with uh, on a world scale very small language, Swedish. Uh, you know, I think that about as many speakers of Swedish as, as there are of Akan around the world. Uh, the, what you learn from an early age is you have to become multilingual one way or another if you want to participate in the modern world. There's no choice. Uh, and that, of course, is a whole orientation, as you say, Renoga, in terms of, of the general culture. And then there are, of course, also subcultural differences, uh, the way that different languages are valued. Uh, and I think it's interesting to look at, uh, we won't have any participants here because they're asleep, <laughs> but immigrant nations like Australia, uh, what that means in terms of the generational shift. Uh, so I, I think this is a very rich area. And again, coming back to the understanding of an engagement with COVID-19 in terms of, of the different languages that are involved. And, and Again, the registers, you know, where do we get the public health uh, announcements, health, uh, uh, sorry, advice? Where do we get the regulations about behavior to do with, with COVID-19 outbreaks? Uh, what are the, in, in, in the sort of registers of casual conversation, chatting, uh, sharing experiences, is that in another language and so on? So I think that's very, very important to understand. Also in reaching out to people, making sure that they have access to the best information available. Um, so, so absolutely fascinating. How are the Brazilians doing? I, 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 uh, see I guess, I guess Brazil. that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Many thanks for having us. First, first, and and above all, very very happy to be here with three of my students, um, and yeah. a fantastic time to see you guys again, all together. Brooke, since 2013, I think we have met last time. Christina and Christian, 
and to get to know all of these splendid people who have been talking for the past two days. Um, I've been listening to what you have been saying, and I think it was back in 2013, Christian put out a paper called Ideas and New Directions. And in that paper, it seems that he was predicting what was to happen in terms of multilingualism. And we are here in a pandemic situation, looking into this language or into this multilingual world that we have at our hands today. Some Chinese people or the Australian people could not be here today, but look at how many languages we have here. So I, I want to congratulate you. I even get chill bumps from this project that you have your hands in. Um, and yes, count with us at all times. Um, I was talking to one of them and I said, here, this is your final year project metaphor. What do others say about us in pandemic times, right? Because it's, it's you've said Christian Bolsonaro and the president, and but we, we here, we don't speak English. It's 3% of the population that speaks English. Yep. So what it is that us, the 3%, me, Marceli, Marcelon, Clara, who speak English, what can we get from outside to inside, right? So we want to hear, we want to listen to their voices and to understand what is said in English about Brazil. So this is one way that we want to start contributing to this multilingual paper and maybe compare to what is said in, in the same level of media or social media. We don't know. We have to establish where, but we are always in with you guys. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Uh, and and I, I, I think this is so wonderful. And it's, of course, it's, it's a two-way exchange. So there is a lot of insight, uh, a lot of experience that we can't access because it's in Brazilian Portuguese or it's in Ewe uh, or it's in, in Tamil and so on and so forth. Uh, and I hope that is also something we, uh, that we can work with in enriching the, the sort of collective uh, uh, human experience here. Uh, I'm very happy to also to see this uh, great balloon linguist. Oh, yes. This is a festive <laughs> that I wanted to put up for yes. the <laughs> first language and pandemic conference. <laughs> it's working. It's working. <laughs> uh, the, the, the white balloon, I, I, it, it, it's, it's very dynamic. It says para something. Uh, para beans. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. congratulations. In Portuguese, in Brazilian Portuguese. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chloe. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to read out the next question if I may, and I have received an answer from, from Dr. Lee. So the question was, and, and it connects to this issue of how governments present themselves and then how they are perceived by others, which is there's often some difference there. Um, so the question is, this is what I received from somebody on email. Though we can observe the efforts that the Chinese government has taken to construct a positive image of itself, how is this kind of strategy perceived by other states? If this strategy does not work well, what other discourses can the Chinese government use to improve its international status? And then Dr. Lee replies, as for the first question, so that's um, how is it, is it perceived by other states? As for the first question, to be honest, I didn't do any research about other states' perceptions of these dispersive strategies. So Elaine, this is what you were bringing up. Um, so Dr. Lee says, what I focus on in the study is the constructive function of discourses, but readers' perceptions and acceptance of these strategies are really questions worth thinking about and can also be a direct direction for future study. In my research, the phrases I analyzed are not culturally specific and they are frequently used in discourse. So I think it's not difficult for people from different cultural backgrounds to understand the meaning expressed in the strategies used. Besides from the perspective of text producing, here means the translation of diplomatic discourse. Translators should take readers' cultural background and values into consideration in advance and avoid using ambiguous words like metaphorical words and words with a strong cultural identity. If they have to be used, interpretation should be attached to them to avoid misunderstanding. In brief, international publicity translation should give full consideration to a reader's acceptability in order to make them work well. 
And then she's added a comment to say the least if the strategies really don't work well, which brings us to the second, second question, other discourses like political discourse, news reports, leader speeches can also play an important role. My research tends to give some enlightenment to language users to let them see the significance of language in constructing and improving international status. Um, so that's um, a kind of um, recap of, of some of the things that we've just been saying. Elaine, would you be able to, to say how, how that works for Brazil? Is it, I mean, it's quite different from the Chinese government in that it does not appear to be putting out white papers in the same way, for example. I don't know if you were able to see Dr. Lee's page, um, presentation. No, I could not see this presentation, and, oh, and I, it was there was some some bits and pieces that were cut from you. I might be in my internet. Yes, yeah, so and the sound isn't the sound isn't terrific. Yeah, in some cases. Uh, it just, I mean, while you, while you're thinking, Elaine, it, it does remind me of something. Uh, a conversation I started uh, about a quarter of a century ago. This was a conference in Beijing in 1996. Uh, and I met a, a very nice man, great scholar, Professor Dahal uh, from uh, Nepal. Uh, he was at Kathmandu University. And when he discovered that I was in Sweden, he lit up and, and you know, almost embraced me. He may have embraced me and said, ah, look, we're both from very small countries. We have to keep together and support one another. Uh, and I think what the way I want to link that, I think it is an interesting issue in uh, in relation to what we've been talking about. I mean, who gets hurt? Uh, now, if you're China, if you're Brazil, uh, if you the US and so on, uh, chances are you will get hurt. But what about uh, smaller nations, uh, nations that uh, may have uh, also some kind of, of language barrier, but certainly don't have access uh, the same kind of access to uh, the channels that will allow people to to hear what what's going on, their experiences, their, their uh, problems, solutions, and so on. Uh, and I think I would I, I would invite big countries to think carefully about this, uh, right? Because I think that's part of how you perceived, uh, and you you sort of have to think about. Uh, the the relationship between uh, very powerful nations and uh, tiny little nations, what that means in, discursively, uh, right? And in terms of, of um, the ability to pull together a, a balanced collective picture of what's, what's happening. Um, what I think when I say, um we will see what others say about us because what gets heard outside is what is said by government, by um, powerful people, so to speak, right? So we, linguists, doctors, we get heard and read by people of our area. But then when you get government, when you get politics, when you get um, media, news so it gets expanded and i think metaphors they do have a purpose they are not there by chance right and and to control these metaphors um it's a bit hard and if if we get talking about politics talking about our you know, say four last presidents we can have this beautiful corpus here to listen and to talk to and to analyze politics, a metaphor in politics, right? So I think when, when we are looking to um, metaphors, we as linguists, Dr. Ryder said the other day that she gave a talk here in Brazil, one of the questions was, how is it that doctors are going to benefit from linguistics. And she said, because you're a specialist on that. So you do your work and we contribute to your work. And we, we it's, it's, it's a double way, right? 
So I think we do need to look into this. And, and as I said before, I want to know through metaphors what people say about us and what was said. And then maybe because we have this bilingualism, we may be able to compare what was said and what people say. And then we kind of get discussing to this metaphorical at the lexical level, Christian, as I said before, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's important to do that. If I could just uh, um, uh, respond to that, Eleni, and thank you for that comment. As a physician, um, I am privileged to be in very intimate spaces with, with patients in their most vulnerable times. And yet there is an inherent power differential that exists between a patient and, and, uh, and, and their, their care provider. Because as a patient, you're vulnerable. You're, you're, you're relying on someone to take care of you and hopefully they will keep you alive in the most difficult times. And, and you have to put your faith there and your trust. In a similar manner, and this is a metaphor again, between our leaders and citizens. And I look also at large countries and small countries. And here we have three similar kinds of circumstances where we have a power differential between large and small. Whether or not we're talking about physician and patient, um, government leader and citizen, or large countries and small countries, all of them metaphorically there of knowing that, that there is an inherent power differential and are you heard? Are you seen? Are you acknowledged? Are you respected? Are you shown compassion? Are you shown justice? And that comes back to what we talked about with the, the charter, as, as you know, the International Charter of Human Values. And the reason I have to say what we mean by human values is compared to values in other ways, because many people think of values and you go to a store and they say, well, we've got a good value for you. You're only charging this amount for this product. That's not the values we're talking about. We're talking about the values of what it means to be human and caring for one another. And the reason I bring this up is because we want this translated. We want to hear. And the reason we're, Hedra is reaching out doing this, this group of us who are passionate about this, and we welcome you to help us with this task, is that, is that we want to hear those voices that may not be heard because they're small, come from a small place, or because the governments won't let them. And we realize that this, it can be politically difficult, but maybe through metaphor, we can get this out. And I'm curious as to how the message of Mr. Trump affected other countries around the world and the way that they perceived or approached the coronavirus. I personally believe, and I will tell you right now, if I were if I were in charge of this country, I would put him on trial for what I would call manslaughter in the sense that he did not do what he needed to do to keep people alive. And there are many people who contracted it and hundreds of thousands of people who died because of his poor leadership. As far as I'm concerned, that is something that is a punishable offense, but that's who I am. That's my belief. You can tell I did not support the man, but I think that it, he affected other leaders around the world. He affected the way that it was perceived. So how we get the message out when science is what we're talking about, but even then, how does science get out? And a whole other area of, of research interest potentially would be the generational gap between people who listen to the, the, the figurehead. You know, um, I'm of a certain age, so I expect one thing from somebody as compared to somebody else. Our, our, our children who are mid thirties go to social media or use it in something entirely differently. And I'm sure you all experience the same thing. So there's probably a rich vein, depending on, on, on country, on culture of, 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 of social apps and accessibility to social media as to who listens to what and how the message gets out. Ultimately, science will out. You know, truth will come out eventually for, for what, what is happening. But how, how do we find the balance here? And I agree with you, the metaphor, you know, we talked about the militarization of the wartime presidents and, and we talked about this. I look at this more as the bully approach. And, and so I want to know what metaphors people use because I want to hear the voices of people who are not heard. And that's why this conference, that's why I'm a believer in this. That's why I'm so excited to see you all. And I'm hoping that we can, we can find ways to communicate this, to bring it together, to put it into something that can be seen more visibly uh, by, by the, the, the leaders of the world in other ways that they might not see this. I will stop there. Thank you.
I want to say that I absolutely agree, and I think that was a, a, a wonderful way of, in a sense, abstracting a fractal principle from the whole. Uh, I mean, this, you know, this different that difference that gets manifested in different environments. Uh, so I think that that is a very productive way of, of uh, uh, moving forward, informed by that. Very, very important. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to hear from some of the students. Who wants to put a word in? Zuna, Marcelli, Clara. It will kill me. <laughs> you are in a safe place and you are our future. We want to hear from you. You are yeah. Yeah. from the That's future. Right. <laughs> yeah. Today is Juno's birthday. Do you want to say something, Juno? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Who, whose birthday I missed? This is Sean uh, dropped out. Yeah, his name is Marcelon, but he, we call him Junior. Oh, Junior, yes. So it's Junior's, Junior is becoming more senior today. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, th thanks very much <laughs> for the congratulations. And today I'm turning a new age. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Junior, Junior is actually a PhD student and a great contribution to us, I think, to what we're doing now. Junior is also, besides being a linguist, he's a pharmacist. Ah, yes. So, yeah. so he's, he, he sees things we don't. And, right? and he and, talks about this changeover between being a customer and being in a much more and much different relationship. So I just really would like to hear what you had to say about about what Brooke just said. Hi. Nice to see Hi. You. How, are you doing? How are you doing, guys? Uh, actually, I am a postgrad uh, student. Alain is my advisor, and I'm conducting a study in the drugstore context, uh, searching how the interaction between the pharmacists and the customers inside the pharmacy. Uh, are important to get the the consult the consults inside the clinics because here in Brazil there are a lot of drug stores that they have clinics inside and this is a good benefit for the for the population itself because uh, sometimes the customers go to the pharmacy and they think that they are inside uh, uh, like a hospital or a clinic and they ask you for for getting the service and a lot of services have been cut have been undertaken inside the 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 pharmacies and i'm going to study the interaction between pharmacists and customers and how this contributes to the format uh pharmatic, i'm sorry i forgot the, the name here because it's very specific for the phar pharmaceutical area uh, but it's about the therapy how this contributes to the therapy with medicines, and um, it's the, the study that I'm going to conduct in the PhD studies. And I'm really happy to be here speaking with you. And I wasn't prepared to speak <laughs> with you, but now I, I am so happy with this opportunity. Thanks, Aline, for the opportunity. Christian, I'm so happy to be here to uh, talking to you. It's, uh, it's really wonderful for myself, and I hope to contribute with the system functional area. And, and that's all, guys. I, I think I, I, I need to, to study a lot in this new, new moment of my life because I'm, I'm going to start my doctorate soon, and uh, I want to contribute a lot in this area gathering two areas of knowledge that I have, the linguistics area and the pharmacy area, because I'm also a pharmacist, as Alain said, and I'm really happy to be here, taking this part with you. Fantastic. Uh, I think that, that's, that's wonderful. And, and uh, if I link that to what Brooks said, looking at the future, uh, let me take another area of, of interfaces, uh, you know, what's now, generally called uh, um, educational linguistics, a term that introduced by Spolsky in, in, in the early 70s. I think the breakthrough in educational linguistics came from analogs. I mean, 
examples like you, meaning people who come from education, they have the experience of different uh, settings in education, and then they went into linguistics. Uh, I think that's that's the future when we can create these, uh, you know, you could say bi bi metalingual uh, uh, exp experts, uh, and that's if we can if we can uh, see that kind of development that you are on the path to, uh, I think that will make a huge difference. Uh, absolutely, Brooke. <laughs> sorry, I, yeah. I just wanted I wanted just to echo what you're saying, Christian, and and as someone who is not a linguist but who has worked with linguists in the last 10 years or so and has come to have a profound appreciation for the analysis of the language and, and the way we communicate. Um, I think that, that those of you, and most of you are linguists, um, you, you have a particular perspective that you see, but those of us who are outside the field have, have a wonderful appreciation for what you do. And the, 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 the question is, how do we get more people aware of the importance of linguists and analysis of of the communication and what we think we're doing versus what we are really doing. And this is this is a powerful situation. The pandemic, of course, is a, is a perfect location for that, but it's great. And I just want to say thank you to Junior. I see two things. Number one is that I follow a lot of Brazilian uh, football stars who are known by one name. So forevermore, Junior, you're going to be Junior because, because it's a one name, you know, the Brazilian, you know, manifesto, if you would. And the second thing is that the interprofessional nature of what we're talking about here is the cusp between different professions where we have our most exciting opportunities to learn from each other and to find and to forge new new paths. And that's what Christian was talking about. That's what you're showing here. My wife, who is both a pediatrician and a social worker, the same kind of thing. And I welcome all of you to contribute in this way because of the many fields and strengths you bring to it. Thank you. So the good news is, Junior, you still have quite a bit left of your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, actually, I'm studying here. I'm studying because tomorrow I'm going to get a presentation and I'm studying here. And yes, I have the rest of the day here to to enjoy my birthday. And it was a really, <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad to talk to you. It's uh, a gift from, from my birthday. And yeah. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. that's a very nice way of looking at it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, the healthcare area here in Brazil needs a lot of attention, and probably not probably, but I hope to to contribute with this area too, because we need to work a lot to know how the language is effective to conduct it to uh, more uh, contributions in the healthcare area, because here there is a lack of of uh, of health issues and uh, probably the language will contribute a lot with the these studies and also with the population. It's going to be really effective these studies. Yeah, I think one thing that's important to say is that one of the first studies I started because I ended in Brazil, I ended or I started my new life in Brazil in 2017, <laughs> um, not long ago. And um, started in starting in this healthcare, bringing uh, all that I learned in Hong Kong from being in touch with you guys and working in the in the, the international charter with I and, and many others. It's the need of analysis in professional areas. Um, but the biggest barrier that we've been facing here is to show people that we do not want to intrude in their workspaces. <laughs> we don't want to be intrusive. And the first research we, we conducted with Marcelli was on um, therapeutic discourse. But um, the biggest issue here was to get into a session to collect data and the, the, the responses of the psychologist was, oh, but I'm doing my, my work has been done, doing okay. My patients have a good result. We don't need linguists here, right? So it's like linguists speak correctly. So I do not need you to teach me what to say to my patients, but that's not, that's, that's nice. So in the end, we were able to get a linguist 
psychologist, and there we went. So I think it's groundbreaking work we're doing in Brazil. Um, it, 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 we need to start somewhere. And Marceli, Eric's not here today, and I, the three of us, have been conducting research here to try to show off right to show people that we need this interprofessional discourse and i need to contribute there but they need to contribute here and and vice versa right how can we be helping or assisting in health areas healthcare issues and and i think the charter is a way to start so i think the translation of the charter has to be asap and we need to put it everywhere, in every media, everywhere, so people know the relevance and the importance of really taking care of this um, compassion, compassion for health, right? So I think it's, it's really important you raise this issue. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Um, I, further to some of that, um, one question that came up in Dr. John and Her's paper was the question of what language encourages people emotionally. So, it's sort of aside from the war metaphors and the monster metaphors and tsunami and crime and all the rest of that, what actually encourages people? Um, because we've got quite a quite a long road ahead of us with COVID. Um, this is not going to go away very fast. And even when it goes away, we'll still be talking about it. Um, so something to consider. A any thoughts? What language encourages people to carry on with this challenge? Well, wh wh while people are thinking, uh, I, I think one of the challenges, and it's come up, also in, in during our roundtable discussion today, I think is, I, I come back to the notion of register or, you know, the, the different discourse types of different genres. Uh, and I think it's very clear. I mean, at least anecdotally, you, you, you look at people that different people have different orientations towards uh, registers. Uh, so some are very keen on, on uh, consuming uh, scientific registers or findings from science that have been presented in ways that are accessible to the general public, uh, right? Uh, you can go to WHO and you can get this information, for example, right? But lots of health agencies, authorities also put it up. Others are more in tune with, uh, you know, what you do in casual conversation among friends or family members uh, now, of course, magnified through social media, okay? Uh, others consume a lot of general news, but through some particular, uh, to use a popular um, metaphor today, a particular lens. Uh, I think part of the challenge then is to find what are the ways in for different people, but also to nudge them, to encourage them to get maybe a more uh, well-rounded overall picture uh, and I think one of the challenges is, is uh, precise, precisely to nudge people to expand their repertoire of what they consume as it were, or what they engage with. Uh, I think that's, that's a considerable, considerable challenge. Uh, now, that's an impression, uh, not, not based on, uh, you know, empirical, empirical study, but, but I, think, uh, I think that has a lot to, to support it anecdotally. And I, we could come back to that about cultural, subcultural differences, what it means in terms of different languages as well. Uh, but I think to move a whole uh, population, you, you sort of need to access them in different ways. There have been some studies, uh, let me mention one, uh, uh, Kayla Zhang, uh, she did a study, this was her PhD, of uh, public health posters. And what she did, she put together two, two corpora, she compiled two corpora, public health posters in New York and public health posters in Hong Kong. 
since since then she has expanded to include London and Sydney as well. It was a multimodal study. She, she looked at the at the text uh, in 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 the different languages, and she, she also looked at the the layout, the images, and analyzed this as well. And she found interesting differences between New York public health posters and Hong Kong. I think this is also the kind of study that can help us uh, see how health authorities try to reach the general population. Uh, and it would be interesting to follow on, follow on from that and expand it uh, and have a sense also what's effective, what's successful and less, less effective. Brooke, I see you have a point. I, 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 I can't help but think about the earlier conversation about metaphors and think now about what you're talking about. And let me, let me use an analogy that I see in my work as a physician, because I think it fits here. Language is dependent on one's understanding. So I, I, I barely speak English. I don't have any other languages I speak. So I rely on that. And so I imagine that, that there's an inherent bias by the individuals who are communicating about, about the value and, quality and, 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 and utility of a particular language. I imagine if I spoke other languages, I might be able to find them more hopeful. But to me, we have not only language, we have a means by which we communicate. Are we talking about social media? Are we talking about direct or some other means? I want to say, how about, the, as, as was alluded to here, the person-to-person -person contact? And I'm going to bring it back now to the moment when we are in trouble as patients. We are vulnerable. What brings us hope? There are usually two things that bring hope. One is that we are heard and seen and feel safe. And how that's communicated by the person who's caring for you, both verbally and non-verbally. How do you show kindness? How do you show compassion? And that's done by both verbal and non-verbal means. And as a radiologist, I have about less than a minute to connect with somebody and have them feel safe and trust me. And the second thing is truth. I, I share with them truth. I want to give them hope, but I want to give them truth because most people know if you're not telling the truth. And so if, if the, from my brief experience as a physician of about 40 years, I say brief in the range of what we're all talking about, to me, and this is just an impression, it is the way we share our kindness and caring, the way that we share truth, at the same time, leave a window of hope open. And how do we go forward in our communities, with our families, more nationally, more broadly, with the COVID to say, we will get through this in the same way we'll get through any other things that come against or, or, or challenges, but we do it with, with, with that. And, and it's by coming together and knowing that we can't do it alone. It, it, uh, it makes me think of, of something else. I mean, let me just add very quickly while, while people are thinking. Uh, there's an interesting series of studies by a Chinese American scholar. He's an economist, Keith, Keith Chan, I think his name is. Uh, and he's looked at economic behavior. I mean, how people plan, how they save and so on. Uh, and he's looked at this relative to what is their operational uh, language, mother tongue. So for example, he's contrasted Chinese and English, but other languages as well. And he's found what seem to be statistically uh, very strong correlations, for example, having to do with how the language is modeled time. Uh, so it's not a matter that of, of a language forcing in one way, it's, it's really languages giving you different resources for uh, understanding the world, but also for valuing, for enacting values uh empathy or poor and so on and if if the language has a certain orientation or a systematic orientation in the way it models time then it may encourage people to think more about the future plan ahead all right i mean this is subliminal and it's not one system uh, it's a kind of a systems that are a, in in lockstep with one another so it's, it, I, I'd be very wary of, of looking just to say observable connectors and trying to it, relate them to culture. It's, it's more complex than that. Mm. Uh, but it's an interesting area of study. Now he's done this as an economist uh, using language, but uh, it could be a source of inspiration for us. 
Uh, I mean, history has done other things, but in, in, in linguistics, of course, it, it does relate to the so-called Sophia Wolf hypothesis about uh, worldview and language and relativism and so on. And there is much more evidence coming through strongly supporting this. It was knocked by the Chomskyans and Universalists for quite a long period in the 60s, 70s, but it's coming back. Uh, now. Oh, Ike! Well, well. Yeah, Christian. Uh. Hi, Mike. <laughs> oh, uh. nice to see you. Or at least to see your name. <laughs> <laughs> Will we see your face? Perhaps not. <laughs> I think I think you're anxious to see your face. So if you show up, that could help us. But at least we had a nice nice greeting. Yes. I hear some. <laughs> but while we're waiting for Isaac's face. So, so what I wanted to add to that was, I think most of this research has been uh, in the orientation of perception, perceptual, conceptualization, uh, how we construe our experience. But we also need studies in the interpersonal area uh, that you talked about, Brooke, and others have too. I mean, the, the question of how we establish rapport, how we, how we enact empathy, uh, how we come together and so on. Uh, and I think there has been much less research there looking across languages, uh, but it is, of course, uh, absolutely essential in our context. I'm guessing you are Isaac. Hello, Isaac. We had Enoch for a moment. Uh, Isaac has... We've got Enoch. Yes. Isaac is still here. Yes. Is Enoch here and Isaac's here? Good. Um, yeah. I, Christian, I wanted just to raise the issue that that um, communication, uh, as as um, um, Suzanne Kurtz, mm -hmm. who is who is not a linguist but who is an expert in healthcare communication, talks about values and communication skills. And she said, she said, if in America you sell used cars and make people think they're the best in the world, you have very good communication skills. You may have no values whatsoever because you're selling them a piece of junk, but you may be a very good communicator. Now I think about that and the issue of advertising. In America, people can advertise drugs, companies advertise drugs, and they ask, ask by other parts of the world where they cannot. And this gets into healthcare communication and what is, what is truth versus what is sales. And, 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 and so when you talk about this and you talk about helping give people hope, I wonder if people can reflect on, on the issue of of, of, of how we know truth in what we are told, whether it's about the pandemic or so about a product or something else. And I come back to Junior as a pharmacist and as a linguist looking at, at information that's accurate. And I, I talked about this briefly in my presentation saying that you know it is up to the customer to know the legal ramifications of something they're taking and, and where the limits are of liability if, if the drug could hurt them um, because it's in a small print someplace. So, I bring this up because it, because I think part of what we do as linguists, if you would asking you, is how do we how do we make sure that that what is represented is represented accurately, um, and I think that's what was being talked about by Eleni and the psychologists. You know, um, I think it's a, it, it's it, it kind of it, it, it covers all of this in a in a form. Uh, thank you. I think uh, my personal research also shares a lot with what uh, you just said, uh, especially looking at the patient information request where pharmaceutical uh, companies are not willing to actually make us believe that uh, their medicines are causing some sort of side effects and they would be happy to make us feel that the side effects are self-evolving or they are general, so to speak, with every kind of medicine. Now the question bothering whether or not uh, we have to teach them how best to represent that is also a tradition in linguistics that gradually we have moved away from are called the prescriptive type of linguistics. 
that we sort of tell them that this is the best way to represent that. By and by, the functional approach to language make us understand that these are experiences and people have choices and they can make choices from the resource we have to express these things. What we can do going forward probably is to identify cases where such expressions lead to ambiguity. And when we have ambiguous structures, then we have a problem. But if there are alternative ways of really saying virtually the same thing, of course, we can't say the same thing in different ways. Then we, we may have to allow them to make uh, their choices. That's crucially important, absolutely, isn't it? Uh, and what, what YouTube just said made me think of, of another uh, brilliant young Ghanaian scholar. Uh, we have a number of them here, here at the round table. Uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Coffey, Enoch and, and Ike, you know him. Uh, yeah. He's in his approaching his final year of PhD study. Uh, the study is not healthcare communication per se, but it's actually very relevant. What, what uh, Joseph is doing is analyzing Ghanaian uh, alcohol commercials. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating. Uh, what he's coming up with. It's again, uh, multimodal. So he's looking at the language, but he's also looking at it from the point of view of, of a sort of, of theoretically informed uh, film analysis. And I think this is an interesting example of uh, very significant differences across countries in what is, uh, as it were, uh, legal to do. Uh, and also, of course, what is, is accepted in the community. Uh, and Joseph got into this precisely for uh, because he was concerned about the damage that this is doing in, in Ghanaian society, uh, in particular the way it attracts uh, younger people. So I think we come back to the question of uh, what's attractive, uh, what's, you know, what, what sort of just uh, passes pe people by. Uh, but that is, uh, I think, a fascinating study. <laughs> And I saw back on, on Sweden where uh, the, the uh, you know, the bottle shops, they owned by the government, uh, commercial companies can only sell beer uh, and uh, they advertise against their products, uh, essentially. <laughs> so, you know, there are big differences here, but it's all part of, of, of the question of, of general public health, really. Um, that, that, that relates to a, a study that, that I'm actually doing in Cambodia in, in terms of um, the interactions between drugstore workers and customers and the extraordinary power of the kind of conversational rituals, how you greet people, how that conversation goes. And the drugstore workers in Cambodia um, are not trained. And because of the healthcare system there um, and because of the way everyday life goes, Western medicine is not really trusted. But mm -hmm. the rituals of conversation in, in Cambodian daily life are very much trusted. And so this, so an ordinary person will come to a small pharmacy, which may be um, more or less um, not really a, a proper building. Um, and in this ritual of greeting each other and explaining what is wrong, they will explain their symptoms and the drugstore worker who may or may not have any education beyond high school education will prescribe and sell them something. Um, and and that, that boundary between the customer and the patient almost doesn't exist. Um, and some of the things that get sold uh, are also non-Western medicine. And then there are a certain number of cultural um, you could say um, beliefs about the power of injections. And so any medication which can be given by injection is considered to be much better. And um, for this reason, pharmacies will routinely sell hypodermics with a variety of things in them. And um, the customer does this to themselves. Um, so, I mean, from, from the point of view of, of, of me, uh, recording these things, um, it's a bit scary. Um, but it is very interesting that concepts of safety are themselves cultural. Um, and this is in some sense in conflict with 
what we know to be the case, or anyway, um, I'd love to get some response to that, but I think we know it to be the case, um, but some of this is not really a good idea. Um, so that's a rather rambling uh, response to what Christian just said. Christina, the, the, the issue of the placebo effect mm. of giving somebody a sugar tablet and having them get better in a certain percentage is a somewhat analogous to this. Mm. The person who's, 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 who's there in distress and trusting through the ritual of connection, mm. trusting that that person knows what they're doing, they're going to do best for you. Mm. you they can give you a, a, a sugar tablet and if, or inject salt water and you may get better in a certain percentage because you want to believe it's the hope process that you are receiving either they share that with you directly or you're inferring it by by the way they communicate it to you i find that a fascinating project it, it certainly is and i mean the whole sort of visual look of a clinic of a contemporary building that is a clinic is in many respects off-putting to many people in that context so i mean all the things that we would actually find reassuring about the look of a clinic um, it's very much not traditional in that culture. Um, and the way that doctors and patients talk is not this very, very slow, very formal, very charming um, way that Cambodian traditional culture operates. Um, so that's part of the problem for safety and for health outcomes. Here, uh, here in Brazil, uh, there are some cities that they only have, the, the population only has access to the pharmacy because the access of the health public services is really rare. And sometimes the population needs to go to the pharmacy and they believe on what the attendants and the pharmacists talk to the population. And this interaction is really, uh, is, it's really uh, wonderful because I can see that the population only has this access and they trust in what we, we say to them. And it's one way of getting the, the access of health in, inside some cities in Brazil. However, uh, sometimes it's really difficult to deal with this, these people because as they don't have very huge access to this, uh, the health services, sometimes they, think that we are not pharmacists and attendants inside the pharmacies. They think that we are physicians and it's difficult to deal with this difference between uh, which professional is in the pharmacy. And they trust on ourselves a lot. And it's really important to, to understand how the interaction, the language used between these, these people uh, works on health issues and how to to people get these advices from the, the these professionals inside the pharmacies and how they they get the benefits from this this interaction. Yeah, but there's, there's, only, there's sorry, a real sorry. upside to it. There's a real upside to it. You're quite right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I work in a farm in a drugstore here, and I. I am the only professional sometimes in the pharmacy that I can interact to the population and give them some advice. And sometimes I, I get a little bit frust frustrated and upset, but it's my, it's my job, I need to do my best. And uh, it's what we uh, best, what we can do the best from ourselves to help the population. And this is, this some, sometimes it's frustrating, but for me it's awesome because I'm doing my best uh, with my job and I can help people to, to be better when they have some issues and some problems, health problems, especially health problems. Well, that, that complementarity of uh, professional expertise is, is an intriguing issue, isn't it, Brooke? It, it is, Christian, and I, and I thank you, Junior, for that. Um, if someone has no other access to care, then someone who has some information is going to be powerfully important for them. Um, and, and as they become more sophisticated, then they, then they will need to take ownership of, of what they can learn from you versus some other means. But, but I think that we're talking about a broad range of population, and you're talking about those folks who don't have access in the other way, or perhaps access to information or access to care 
and and you become a lifesaver in many ways. At the same time, it becomes a burden to feel like, do I know enough? And that and that that's not, that's a hard burden too, you know, to 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 say, am I doing all I can do? And so I I congratulate you on what you are doing, and also the 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 fact that you're learning a linguist uh, a linguistic approach to it to to understand better about what what you're what you're able to contribute. Yes, I, I guess that the, I think the language is really important to, to this communication, and it, been, it can be really effective some in some in some way. And I think studying the language in this uh, professional area and how the how the country what's the contribution that can that the population may get it's really amazing. And conducting a research in, in this area will be really important for. To, to get more to more to more to conduct more uh, researches and to help people and I think this is really important to not only for the population this itself but for the scientific area and it's really amazing to conduct researches on this and 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 the ethical integrity of the of the pharmaceutical companies for example and what information they provide you or they make available to the population that's the other piece of this that we look at because obviously they the, the, the people you're serving need to be able to afford the medications um if you're talking about pharmaceuticals and at the same time get accurate information and you need to be able to 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 know what what from your own perspective what makes the most sense for the patient and 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 is the pharmaceutical pharma, the information from the pharmaceutical companies uh, trustworthy Ready? I think there may be connectivity problem. He's, he's uh, connected and, and disconnected a couple of times. I noticed. It, I, I thought maybe he, he was about to say something because I said, okay. The European Union has a, a policy on the nature of information pharmaceutical industries can put on their leaflets. I think this is a fascinating aspect. Maybe we all need to explore policy with regards to health information. Uh, I, I remember uh, Christian initially mentioned uh, educational linguistics. You, you remember when Spolsky and Co. started introducing and discussing uh, educational linguistics, then policy could actually, you could aim at policy in, educational, in education and language. But now we are talking about language and health, in my view, it's uh, about time that policies regarding the nature of information to be placed on information leaflets, for example, or health information need to be enacted. I was really fascinated, actually, to see that you cannot just write anything uh, on your leaflet in Europe. But here in Ghana, uh, you go to the, the, the pharmacy, and then you, you buy about two, three different uh, medicines and you realize that the structuring of the information differs, which means uh, the pharmaceutical industries can actually decide on their own how they write what they have to communicate to us. So uh, going forward, I feel that some of us also have to uh, actually keep up with research and hopefully we may inform policy in future. That is crucial, isn't it? Uh, and and Another aspect of this is, of course, uh, people who uh, have different medical conditions and need to go to different doctors, different specialists, they get different medications. Uh, and uh, that may be very difficult because they're not coordinated. So that's another aspect of that challenge, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was looking into a leaflet that I received the other day. And it's about this, this context in the drugstores here. Where we live, I don't know if it's all like all the same in Brazil, but when I returned, I came to the Northeast and here I stayed. So I would have to do a Brazil research. But here, every quarter you have two drugstores. I mean, we have more drugstores than schools maybe. And, and I'm not joking, it's true. I don't know if this is a phenomenon of the Northeast or what. 
But during the pandemic, so in some drugstores, they have what they call clinic pharma, right? So it's a clinic inside the drugstore where you can talk to the pharmacist. And now they're changing this into a clinic pharma home care. So you don't need to go to the drugstore anymore. They will go to your place. They send it to and you on the motorbike. Yep. So they say it's the best at your place. Um, uh, the, 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 the best services available are blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I'm not going to show which one it is, but you have two people, right? And then you have the pharmacist, the pharmacist and um, the patient. And so it's, it's because of this, I think it's cultural, Christina, as you say. Yeah. And because well, of the pandemic. Convenience is great. Everyone wants convenience. Stuff. Delivery is great. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's delivery of, exactly, delivery of pharmaceutical services. You don't even need to go there, but you can get them at your place. So it is, it is um, cultural to say, but it, it deserves a lot of research. Yeah, it does because, um, it, it it's um who's who's in the role and what they're saying that that, you know, that really matters there. Um, Massalon, I, I was watching your paper with great interest for this reason. Um, wondering about the similarities and the differences. So I have I have a problem here in my connection. Huh. I'm sorry. No. Uh, but I I started to listen to what the line was saying and this, this changing because yes, in some pharmacies, some drug stores here in Brazil, there's the clinic inside and some, some drug store companies have made uh, the, the, there is another type of way of the patients to get in contact with the pharmacists and now they can have their, their consults is, uh, online and this is another way of uh, getting the the interaction between the patient and the pharmacist and this is now starting here in Brazil and probably this is going to work a lot especially because a lot of people want to stay home because of the pandemic and the, the only access they may have will be uh, with online uh, interaction with the pharmacist and so they don't need to go to the pharmacy even though the the movement of people going to the pharmacy uh, during this pandemic has increased a lot I, right. I, I'm working right. I'm working I'm working every single day and in the pharmacy and I see that a lot of people have been uh, in the pharmacy a lot of times right. and now probably there's new service this online service will be good for the population they don't need to stay home but they don't need to go out home they want to stay home and this is going to be uh, better for the population to uh, prevent uh, contra yeah, con yeah. contract COVID-19 if they go out of their homes. Well, and well, probably they, sorry. Go ahead. And probably the interaction between uh, the pharmacist and the patient now with this new model, um, this, this, the contact online will be different from the mm -hmm. contact face-to-face. Uh, -face. Yeah. So maybe new researches will be conducted in, on this new interaction. And this is going to be really wonderful to see how the language works on this yeah. new type of interaction. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Oh, Mike is back. I, I would want to just add that I agree with you what you're saying, Junior. And I think that, that uh, I could call up uh, somebody in Canada in order uh, drugs that I can't necessarily get in the United States from Canada talking with a, a voiceless, I mean, a, 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 a faceless person who has some sort of degree and can do this. My concern about, about doing this is that it's, that, that there's no mechanism for follow-up and that if we assume that medications are only beneficial and have no side effects and have no downsides, it might work well. But if there is any risk, then there's no follow-up mechanism and patients aren't necessarily knowledgeable enough to know whether certain side effects may be from the medication or, or, or evidence of some other part of their disease. Um, I think about a patient that I remember seeing with liver failure 
fulminant liver failure and died from liver failure. And she had been receiving uh, Chinese herbal medicines for some period of time. And those medications were toxic to the liver, yeah. but that she was adamant that, that she take those because of her wellness. And so the, the, the problem comes is that it's, it's what the person who's prescribing it knows and how they follow it up. And, and, and I'm afraid that, that, that with a convenience factor, we don't, and there isn't necessarily means by which it's, there's a follow-up unless it's a pretty sophisticated uh, app, uh, online app, uh, to make sure that the patients are, are followed up. I just share that with you as a thought, because I think that you're right, and I think it's inevitable, but it's a question of, of how do we do it safely. Well, we have had a wonderfully um, wide-ranging uh, conversation, um, and I really want to thank you all for your contributions. Um, it's a great shame that we have would not been able to get people from Asia uh, involved in this conversation, so particularly East Asia and also from Australia. So we miss our friends at either ends of the the. the uh, time scale, um, but uh, I am delighted to have uh, met you all face to face and seen most of you um, and heard from most of you, and um, particularly the, the graduate students. We are very, very pleased to welcome them into this group. You should all have received two projects, and I really look forward to being in touch with you about those projects. Um, Christian, is there anything you would like to say? I'd like to echo what you said, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, very chuffed, uh, absolutely energized and delighted by the two days, by your contributions, and uh, today's uh, roundtable, which extended in size uh, temporarily uh, quite significantly. I think we could uh, continue and go on. Uh, and we will, uh, but maybe not tonight. I'm thinking of my friends in India. It's getting quite late for you. Uh, and I'm, I'm really touched and, and grateful that you've stayed up to take part in this, uh, because I think it's been fantastic to get these uh, intercontinental connections. Yes. Uh, and we've had three significant uh, continents. Well, uh, we can include... <laughs> We can also include Europe, of course, uh, Christina, so four, in fact. Uh, and it's been absolutely exciting to me that we're getting these intercontinental uh, exchanges, conversations. And I do feel very strongly that the uh, conditions for uh, continuing the research are now very different from what they were on Friday uh, in a positive way. Uh, and I think that's tremendous. Uh, Christina, you mentioned the projects that uh, you've, uh, you've written up as, as ideas coming out precisely uh, from the contributions here. Uh, and I'm sure that there are other ideas. Uh, I think the, the question of the complementarity of healthcare professionals, patients, and of course, primary pet carers, friends and families, uh, very important. We know that this is something that varies considerably across uh, healthcare systems, uh, and communication is also very central to this. Uh, so I do think that it's sort of an embarrassment of riches in terms of what we follow up. Uh, I'm sure uh, that there will be uh, spontaneous conversations uh, among all of us uh, continuing this. I would again like to emphasize uh, that one, one other unique aspect, apart from the, the networking aspect, but very closely related, is the pathway to publications. Uh, and as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, this is already <laughs> underway uh, and we will pursue this. Uh, I think the strength will be in uh, thematic complementary contributions. Uh, it will take some time, but we hope that we can uh, push on this uh, and it's not going to uh, linger in some, some uh, uh, shelf, uh, sorry, in some, some drawer somewhere. It's uh, on the immediate agenda. Uh, and uh, Christina, we'll make this recording available to uh, 
Yes. Our friends and colleagues. Who yes, are not yes. Um, we will upload it to YouTube. Yeah. And so you can watch this again if you if if you'd like to. Uh, and thanks to those of you who have attended but not had a chance to speak, uh, like uh, Kazu, for example. Ike, uh, you did come on briefly, Ike. Uh, we didn't see your <laughs> yeah <laughs> your sunny face, but, uh, but I'm I'm very very happy and grateful. Uh, and uh, you know, I remember one occasion. This was a computational linguistics AI conference. I think it was in Texas, maybe San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and I was talking to somebody uh, who was uh, quite. Uh, well known in computational linguistics at the time, uh, Bob Simmons. And we were chatting quite nicely. I was just a junior uh, postgraduate student and suddenly I could see his face lit up and he said, excuse me a moment, uh, I see the opportunity to be a midwife. And what he meant was he had spotted two people he'd been longing to bring together for quite a while. And so he trotted away and I'm sure he accomplished this. Now, the midwifery here, I think, is collective. So we're doing this all together uh, and we're all taking part in this. So many thanks. Uh, I feel very excited, very energized, and also very, very grateful. And I look forward to the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, so everyone, lovely to see you. I will be in touch with you by email. And um, thank you. Really looking forward to the project. Good to see you too. Thank you very much. Thank Please you very speak much. well, our Indian friends. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night Carlos, right. baby. Yeah. Many uh, thanks. Uh, Bye. Thank you. Rest or continue birthday celebrations. Thank you. <laughs> <Happy> birthday. <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> and stay safe. Yeah. Okay. And thank you for also yeah. for the chat messages that we will, uh, Christina, I think we can, we can uh, uh, collect the chat messages as well. Yes, we can. Yep. Great. Uh, so Marcel, I, I see your message and uh, we'll, we'll uh, make sure I take, uh, take hold of that. Yep. I'll follow up. Great.